meditating on this and thinking about where to begin, what to talk about tonight, he gave me a scripture, if I can find it. You know, I've, I've got so many notes, I'm not sure exactly where I was supposed to begin tonight. Praise God. Well, it's the one that I think President, uh, Pastor Randy just mentioned just a few days ago, that when my people will humble themselves and pray, that I will heal their land. And I'll hear from heaven and I'll heal their land. We need to really humble ourselves before God and pray like never before because God wants to do a work in America. He wants to do a work in our lives. He wants to do a worldwide work. But you know, we have always, America has always been the nation that has been a giving nation. And I heard one prophecy, one man of God say that, you know, we have never reaped from all that giving that we have done. How many of you know that sowing and reaping is part of God's plan? When we sow something, we usually always reap a harvest from that. America has never reaped that harvest yet that, uh, from all the giving that we have done to all the other nations of the world. They have not even appreciated, a lot of them have not even appreciated what we have done for them. But every time there's a calamity or a disaster anywhere in the earth, America is the first to stand up and to give. Even when we're nearly $20,000 trillion in debt or whatever, that we're still give. And people give very generously to help those. So God has really got a good plan. I think he's got a good plan for America. But we need to pray that it will come to pass and that Satan will not get in there because God will honor man's choices also. He has given man free will. And Satan is going to get in there. And those people that are not committed to God have choices also. And we need to pray that those will, not come, those will not come to pass, that his will would be done in spite of everything. I was listening to several prophecies here just this last uh, week, and you cannot, you know, he has told us that not, there'll be many false prophets in the last days, to not heed every prophet that you hear. And uh, whenever I was beginning to listen to these, I know people that follow certain people just very religiously, and they'll say, well, you know, so-and-so said this last week, so-and-so said that last week. First thing you know, they're caught up in what people tell them with prophecy. And some of these prophets, prophecy does not contradict what God is doing. One of these prophecies, for instance, I heard was that on August 30th, 2016, a month and a half from now, that the Antichrist is going to be revealed, that he's going to stand up and reveal himself. Another prophecy said that the, this woman said that she, uh, that God showed her this, that Obama was the Antichrist. And then it showed a DVD of him actually proclaiming to be the Antichrist. Uh, then there was the other prophecies that said that uh, different things were going to happen, that in the last days that there was going to be, the last president of the United States was going to be a woman. And of course, then they, they all surmise that's going to be Hillary Clinton. And then another prophecy came out and said that, that uh, Donald Trump is going to be the president. So, you know, all these things, they're conflicting. So somebody is wrong here. We don't know who is wrong for sure. So all we have to do is pray that God's will be done. In spite of all these, there's people that come, might come to you and say, well, I heard so-and-so say that this is what's going to happen. And they tell you like that is the gospel truth. You know, you need to pray and seek God's face and pray that his will be done because there are many false prophets that are going to rise up and they're going to deceive many. Uh, let's see where that scripture here is. Matthew 24, 24 in the King James Version. It says, For there shall arise false Christs and false prophets and shall show great signs and wonders insomuch that if it were possible, they shall deceive the very elect. We are the elect. Do not allow yourselves to be deceived. These false uh, prophets, and maybe that in their heart they might be sincere, they might be very dedicated Christians, but because that they get caught up into some, something, that they begin to think that that is a prophecy from God. Uh, and we ourselves need to be sure that whenever God tells us something, that it does not contradict the word of God, and, uh, and that we pray about it. Pray about it before you receive that. Whenever, God, whenever I was praying... Um, about that, that scripture, the urgency of that scripture. I've heard that scripture so many times in my life about that people need to humble themselves and pray and then he will heal, heal our land and he'll hear from heaven. And I've heard that so many times, but when God himself speaks it to you and speaks it to your heart, uh, it is different. It becomes a, a rhema word to you. It's like a direct word from the Father himself from heaven. And whenever that word comes to you like that, you know that it's urgent. God knew that I already knew that scripture. And so why he gave that to me is with such an urgency, I had to take that very seriously. And I hope that you will take that very seriously too. Prayer is the only thing that's going to make the difference in these last days. 
and his desire, his will, we know his will is that many souls be saved. We know it's his will that revival come. And I will tell you that it wasn't, and I believe that we're going to see outbursts here and there of revival happenings. But for this to become the revival he wants to bring on the earth, we're going to have to do some praying and some submitting to God, laying our life down for our brothers and sisters. That means whenever you see a brother or sister in need, here in Proverbs 25, 21, it says, If thine enemy hunger, give him bread to eat. And if he be thirsty, give him water to drink. And there's another scripture, and I don't have it, that says, if you give just a cup of cold water in my name, yes. then we'll be blessed. So just, just doing the little things in life, making sure that we do, that we think of others before ourselves. Always to think, esteem our brother more than we do ourselves. Then God is going to start moving whenever we get into that same one accord and that one mind. Let me see if I can see where some of those other... Uh, Romans 12, 20, 12, 1 talks about our reasonable service. I think I brought this out last week and I want to read it again. 12, 1 in the King James. I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. So presenting our bodies unto God and is laying our life down. And he says it's just our reasonable service. That's what he expects of us to do. Look what he did for us. He laid, he laid his life down so that we would not be condemned for all eternity and tormented in hell throughout eternity. What a terrible thing whenever you think about the number of people that are there already. And God doesn't want to see any more go there. It wasn't prepared for people to begin with. It was prepared for the, the devil and all his angels, those fallen angels that rebelled against God. It was prepared for them. It was not prepared for mankind. And he thought, surely, I think that whenever he paid that ultimate sacrifice, that all people would be, could be saved, and they did it for all of mankind, that would people would become running to him for help. But we have not carried that message forward in the power that he has wanted us to. Now, there has been sporadic times through history. You know, uh, uh, when the apostles were here on earth, by the time of the first century, by the end of uh, 1000 AD, or 100 AD, Gnosticism and other her heretical things were already coming into the church. And Paul, even before he died, he was warning Timothy. He warned Timothy of these false Christs and false people that would be coming into the church. And he began to warn them of them and began to admonish him to contend for the faith. James, James also tells us to contend for the faith. So these things, they already began to see it even then. And through the ages, there has been little sporadic revivals. People have revived. We have seen the Azusa Street revival. That was a tremendous revival. And people moved forward. And first thing you know, then there was tent meetings that went from one thing to another. There was uh, different evangelists that rose up. And uh, people began to get their eyes on them. And first thing you know, people will go just for the miracles. And they weren't heeding the word anymore. We have to have the word along with the spirit or we're going to fall into trouble. We're going to fall into false doctrine and false teachings. So we have to have the word along with it. I love this church because it is such a word church. I love Pastor Randy's teachings because he is so into the word and he searches out the word and he shows us the word. Whenever we, whenever he teaches, he shows us the word. And the people that come here, a lot of them say that's why they like it and because that they know they're getting the word. Or one person say that they learned more on one, one sermon that he preached than they had in all their Christian years. And they had been saved for many years. So the word is extremely important important to keep us on track. We have got to stay on track. Jesus had begun to tell some of his uh, disciples some of the things that were going to be happening in the future, and they had asked him when the sign of the end times would be, and when it would be, and he answered them with the following scripture in Luke. Luke 21, 33 to 36 in the King James. Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my word shall not pass away. And take heed to yourselves, lest at any time your hearts be overcharged with surfeiting. That means carousing. Just, I don't know, carousing probably where you're not supposed to. Drunkenness and cares of this life. Or, the, or could be the worries of this life, you could say. The cares of this life. And so that that day come upon you unawares. Uh, for us, as a snare or a trap shall it come on all them that dwell on the face of the whole earth. So watch ye therefore and pray always that you may be accounted worthy to escape all these things that shall come to pass and to stand before the Son of Men. Here again, he's admonishing us to pray when we begin to see these things coming to pass, 
to pray because prayer is the only thing that's going to really uh, help get the job done. Prayer is the thing that moves the hand of God and we have got to realize that and know it. I used to tell my kids in Sunday school when they were real little that until somebody prays, nothing happens. Nothing happens because God does not interfere with our lives. When people go around saying God did this and God did that, no, God didn't do it, the devil did it. Satan did it. And people that are, are listening to Satan did it. Those things happen and there are terrible things that happen. But whenever we pray, God builds a shield around us and those things can't happen to us because we're his children and he protects us. And so we have, to, we have to remember how important that prayer is. You may not feel like you're getting anywhere when you pray, but he knows your heart. And if you just start out, just if you don't know how to pray, start out reading and saying the Lord's Prayer. That's a good beginning because the Lord's Prayer covers almost everything. That's kind of a pattern of how we're supposed to pray. We're not supposed to just memorize that and repeat that and, and say that it's done. There are specific things that we need to pray. But God is going to really move mightily and give us a revival like we have never seen. And I believe it's coming to our church right here. It's probably breaking out in many places, I think, throughout the world. I believe they're having revival. They're revival is starting but he wants this to spread throughout the whole earth I'll have to tell you I was just debating about whether to tell this or not and I was talking to someone this afternoon that I really highly respect and she felt like I needed to tell this for encouragement sake if nothing else um, I don't know if I had a dream or a vision I think it was kind of like a vision because I was wide awake when this all started and in fact I would had gone into my computer room that's kind of where I go in the middle of the night to pray and I was praying and uh, I just began getting a burden for souls, a burden for different people. And I began calling out people's names. And as I began to call out their name, I could see them begin to raise their hands. And those names, when I called them out, a lot of them would just raise their hands the first time when I called out their name. Some of them, it took them a couple of times to get their hands up. And some of them would just start right like this. And, and, every, and I wouldn't stop until I had called their name until I would see their hands go up. Seems like as I called their name, it was kind of like, made them do something and so I kept calling their names well finally I thought I was all through praying and I went back to bed and I just kept laying there and I was thinking of different people and I started calling their names because I remembered I hadn't called that name yet I hadn't called that name and I was going through all my family people first and friends and close people that I know that I was going through leaders in the church and different people in the church calling everybody's names I finally just ran out of names and by this time I was so in the spirit that I just said God everyone in the church and whenever I said that uh, every hand in a church, I suddenly saw our congregation. And every hand, and it was packed full of people, every hand simultaneously at the same moment went up just like that. And when it did, the glory of God came down and filled this place. And I mean, when that glory of God came down, I thought about Kenneth Hagin. You remember Kenneth Hagin, the story about how he was healed? Whenever he got out of that bed and he said, God, I believe, and he raised his hands, the glory of God came down, raised his hands. Remember that? He stood up and just raised his hands like that. And before that, he couldn't even move his arms, hardly. But he raised his hands and he said, I believe. And when he said that, the glory of God came down and filled that place to the point where when his mother had heard, heard some commotion in there and she went to go into the room and she said she got to the door and it just like she came up against a brick wall and it just threw her backwards and says the glory of God was so powerful in there he was totally healed of every disease and he had at least three or four terminal diseases that the doctors didn't think he would live another day whenever that glory of God comes down and fills this place it's going to be like when it filled Solomon's temple whenever when all of the priests fell out under the power because the power is so mighty but whenever I saw this it was like everybody in the place they raised their hands and everybody in the place that had any kind of a, a sickness, disease, or any kind of an infirmity or problem, everyone in the place was healed. Healed. And that the power of God heals. And sickness cannot stand in the, that kind of power. When God's glory is there, every sickness and disease has to go because it all comes from Satan. Ultimately, I'm not saying that you have a demon when you have a sickness, but it ultimately comes for Satan because he's the one that kills, comes to kill, steal, and destroy. So that, that, I believe that's going to happen, and when it does, you're going to see people lining up to get into this church. Just like his mother ran to the door to see what was going on, people are going to come in here to find out what's going on. And they're going to start calling out on God because it's the miraculous signs and wonders that draw people, that draw people in. 
This is only just going to be a beginning, just a beginning. And it might not happen every single day, but be prepared because you never know. God has suddenlies. And we saw one of them not very long ago right here in this church when all of a sudden the power of God came from that platform and many people were slain under the power just like that. You never know when these things are going to happen. Get ready. Be ready. Be ready at every moment. The other thing I thought of whenever, when I read that prophecy about the Antichrist being revealed in August, I said, well, Lord, I said, I always thought that the church was going to be out of here before the Antichrist was revealed. Hey, and if that came true and if that was the case, then the rapture is going to take place before August 30th. <laughs> so be ready. We never know. He says at a time that you think not, it's coming. Praise God. Uh, let me see if I see another one here that was... Oh, this is another prophecy here. Another prophecy says that the United States is going to have an attack by Russia in January of 2017 that will wipe out all our electric, electrical grids, leaving us with no means of communication and total darkness over the whole United States. We will be back living like the Amish. But you know what? God, if that happens, if that ever happens, God will bring us through it. He will always bring his people through it. That doesn't mean that we're going to die just because we suddenly do not have electricity. It might mean that we might be very hot when we have no refrigeration. It might be we might be very cold when we have no cooling. At that time of year, we would be very cold, wouldn't we? Uh, that sounds very miserable, but people have survived these temperatures before we had all of this uh, luxury. And they are still surviving in places in the world today, just like that. So people can survive. We don't know whether that will come true or not. That's just another one of those prophecies out there. I'm not telling you to believe these prophecies and depend on them. What I'm warning you is that trust God and just get closer to him because you don't know what is going to happen. No one really knows for sure exactly what is going to happen except what Jesus told us that all of these things that people are going to be, they're going to be caught up and just carousing around doing this and that and the other, going about their ways, not even mindful of God, and this thing is going to catch them unawares. Do not let that trap take you in. All right, uh, so we can't let prophecies guide us. We let the Holy Spirit is our guide, isn't it? Do not let prophecies guide you. I have, do have a friend, a very close friend, that just constantly is telling me about some new prophecy. And I said, you need to be careful. You can't just believe, well, so, oh, that guy is a real man of God. He studies the word constantly, this and that and everything. Well, you know, maybe he does. But you still can't depend and believe every single prophecy that you hear. Because that's the, the best way that Satan can lay a trap for you to become deceived. Oh, uh, let's see here. When we do not pray, what we are doing is allowing Satan to have his way. And I told you a while ago what his way was. His will is that none of this revival is going to happen, that nobody else is going to be saved. He wants to take as many people to hell with him as possible. And if we continue uh, just going our way and thinking that all is going to be okay, God loves us, he's not going to allow anything to happen to us, it isn't a matter of him allowing anything to happen to us. It's a matter of that the, the course of this world, he lets men make the choices and do the things that they're going to do. And there's many people on this earth that are directed and led by Satan. How many of you believe that? They are. We all believe that and we know that. So don't believe that nothing evil can happen if we don't pray. Because if Satan has his way, we're all going to be destroyed and wiped out. Whenever I was praying for that, that word, here is that scripture that I want to read to you uh, that God gave to me the other night, and it's really important that we take it to heart. I like to read it from the word so that it, because sometimes when I paraphrase, you miss a lot of important things. Second Chronicles 7.14 in the King James Version says, If my people which are called by my name shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways. How many know there's a lot of wicked ways in America? Oh my God, there are so many wicked ways. Oh, you know, whenever I think about what is happening right now, I try to come against those principalities and powers right now that are even in Washington and in this, this leftist movement that is trying to uh, take away our right, all of our rights and take away uh, our right to even worship 
taking, taking God out of our lives, they even are beginning to intimidate. You know, they will try to intimidate Christians to the point where if they have their way, there will be no more Christianity in America. Already it's been declared we are no longer a Christian nation. We have always felt that we were a Christian nation because we've been founded on Christian principles. We need to contend for that. We need to contend for that. Our founding fathers have established that, uh, that we live under those Christian principles, and we need to contend for that faith as well that was handed down to them. And we need, we need to just believe that God is going to restore that again. I believe God is going to restore us one more time. This is what I believe in my heart. If people will pray and will turn from their wicked ways and begin to trust God and lay down their lives for him, I believe we are going to see a short revival in America of restoration of righteousness in this nation and that Christians are going to become bold and Christians are going to become so anointed and that God is going to begin to use us in a mighty way like never before. I've heard people even come to me and say, I don't know what I can ever do. I don't feel like that I'm worthy to do anything. I don't feel like I'm capable of doing anything. I'll tell you, God loves to take people that are nobodies and make somebody out of them. Look at Moses. Moses felt like that he was a nobody. Here he had been just on the backside of the desert for 40 years tending sheep, and he already felt like he was here. He was 80 years old. He felt like that he was just on his way out, that God could not use him anymore. He wasn't even a good speaker or anything. So what does God do? He gives him a, a mission to go and speak. To Pharaoh. And so and eventually God uses him to lead the children of Israel out. And his man lives to be 120 years old. If God is going to use you, he can extend your life. God only gave that whenever Moses was in the wilderness with those children, uh, the children of Israel that were complaining and everything. That's whenever this, this thing about uh, man has, is allotted 70 years and 80 by means of strength. I don't remember where that scripture is either. But I believe that was to the people that were unbelievers. But look at Joshua and Caleb who were believers. They came back and they went into the promised land and took that next generation in there with them. And Caleb at 85 years old said, give me that mountain. I'm just as strong today as I was at 40, that I still have that strength and I'm going to. And that mountain was where all the giants were. He was ready to go and conquer those giants at 85 years old. His strength was still there. And Joshua's strength was still there. He led those people into all of those wars where they conquered all of the, those uh, nations of Canaan. And God will restore your strength if he desires to use you. You will live until he is finished with you. So make yourself available to him. If you want to live a long life, make yourself available. And do, do according to his word. Live according to his word. And you are promised a long life. Praise the Lord. Uh, Anything that God gives me is really important. And I know, I know that. And I know that whenever he said that we needed to pray that his will be done, that is so important. I wish I could get that across to you, the same urgency that I felt it when I got it, because I know how important that is right now. And right now, our nation, I feel like, is sound, sound, uh, st standing in the balances right now. I think that our nation is just ready to waver one way or the other. And we are the ones that can make the difference. Our prayers is what can make the difference. It can go either way. And, you know, things in this, this nation, if, if, it, if the people that are against God have their way, this nation will never be like we ever saw it again, ever, ever saw it before. We will never be that nation again. So uh, we just really need to pray. And like I said, do not pray for names. Pray for God's will to be done because we don't know what all is going on in the background. Also, come against those uh, Antichrist spirits because the Antichrist spirit is already in the world. It's already here and it's already seeking to destroy people. Uh, there's so much going on in America. God's will needs to be done right now like never before. If Satan's will uh, is done, everything will be destroyed. We will be destroyed. Uh, I had, a, I had a dream one time years ago, probably about 35 years ago. It was a long time before we moved up here. And I don't know if that is ever going to come to pass. We can pray. We see times in the Bible where God gave uh, visions and dreams to people as warnings that something could happen. Now, I've never told this publicly before either, but I'm going to tell you because you need to know how serious this world situation is right now and how desperately we need to pray. In this dream, and it was, so, it was so absolutely real, I woke up immediately afterwards and wrote it all down. And I have it all written out still. And, but it's so vivid in my mind, I don't think I could ever forget it. And in this dream, all of a sudden, I saw a, bo a bomb right about the middle part of the United States hit, right almost center 
of the United States and I felt like it was an atomic bomb because I saw as it went up, I saw this huge mushroom cloud just like you saw in all the pictures over Tokyo at that time and uh, in Japan. And some of you may not be aware of that, but you know, years ago they used to show the news in uh, movie theaters. Whenever you saw a movie, you also saw the news and they showed pictures of things that happened. So I remember visualizing and seeing that. And I saw that mushroom cloud go up. And so many people were just killed outright from the impact of that bomb. But many people, that the clouds, I saw the clouds begin to move and the wind starting to carry radiation throughout the United States. And as the people began to realize this, they began running for bomb shelters. They began running for shelters anywhere that they could go. It was absolute chaos. People were killing other people to get into their shelter if they, if they could find one. And I remember just looking at this and I shook my head and I just remember the words that came out of my mouth was absolutely this. I said, there's nowhere to hide except for those that are in Christ except for those that are hidden in Christ. And I know that was God. I believe God put those words in my mouth. Because at that moment, uh, whenever anything disastrous happens, God is going to be with us because we are in him. We are in him and he chooses to protect you in the middle of it. He will protect you in the middle of it. That radiation will not fall on you. But in the, on the other hand, we can pray and that will not happen. You know, I'm not saying that that's a prophecy. That was just a dream I had. It was very, it was very urgent dream to me, but it's been like 35 years now that I had that dream. So it's been quite some time. And it's more that we talk about all of these, you know, about Iran building this bomb and that eventually they think that they're gonna be able to reach uh, us and other nations. You don't know what might be ahead. I'm telling you, there are dark times coming. There's another scripture that I wanted to give you here. In Isaiah 60, one through five. Here he's speaking to the church. The church is asleep right now. There's so many denominations and churches right now that haven't a clue what is going on in the spirit world. And I'm not saying that I know it all either, but we start, need to start getting ourselves woke up and get aware of what's going on. The church is asleep. I had another dream one time about us all sleeping. And you know, it even said whenever the 10 virgins, whenever the trumpet sounded, that they were all asleep and they arose. They heard the bridegroom coming. They arose and began to trim their lamps. So I believe the church is asleep right now as a whole, generally in America. Then that's why he told us return to our first love. Because if Christians don't return to their first love, these things are gonna catch them unawares. We need to have our lamps trimmed. We need to get our lamps trimmed and be ready. For the, for the Lord is coming soon. All right, here in Isaiah, he says, Arise, shine, for thy light is come. Thy light is come, and the glory of the Lord is risen upon thee. For behold, the darkness shall cover the earth, and gross darkness the people. But the Lord shall arise on thee, talking to his church, to his bride. Now, some people think this prophecy was for Israel, but I'm telling you, there is only going to be one church. Many Jews are going to be in that church. Many Gentiles are going to be in that church. Uh, many peoples of all nations and tongues are going to be in his church. We are the church. We're believers. Only believers are going to be in that church. So, and his glory shall be seen upon thee. And the Gentiles, here's referring to the unbelievers, because in the Bible, the Gentiles always referred to the unbelievers, shall come to thy light and kings to thy brightness of thy rising. Lift up thine eyes round about and see all they gather themselves together. They come to thee. Thy son shall come from afar, and thy daughters shall be nursed at thy side. Then thou shalt see and flow together, and thine heart shall fear and be enlarged, because the abundance of the sea. Now, whenever the Bible talks about the abundance of the sea, he's talking about a multitude of people. Have you ever seen it referred to that there was just like a sea of people out there, a multitude of people? The abundance of the sea shall be converted. Waters don't get converted. People do unto thee and the forces of the Gentiles or the lost shall come unto thee. God is telling his church to arise and whenever we start arising and realizing who we are, people are gonna be coming from all over to ha for help. They're be coming to you for help and for prayer and for guidance and for direction because they're not gonna know where to go. It's gonna to be total chaos. Just last week, whenever they had this, this terrible incident in Orlando, People were falling, uh, saying that even in the building, inside the building, uh, people were on their knees calling out to God. People were outside on the sidewalks calling out to God 
falling down on their knees. I heard that reported actually on the news and saw some people doing that. They were falling down on calling up on God. Whenever this world starts getting, all, all of these things begin to happen and total darkness covers the earth. Now that darkness is probably spiritual darkness. Whenever everything is so terrible and so wicked here and if Satan has his way, it's going to be that way and it's going to destroy all of mankind if he, can, if he has his way. And the only thing going to stop that is going to be our prayers. We need to pray like never before. People are going to come to us whenever this revival starts right here in our building. It's right here in Living Faith. People are going to come off the streets. They're going to be lined up to get inside the door to find out what's going on, that they want some of it. People are looking for something real. They're looking for something real in our individual lives. If we start walking the way that God wants us to walk and living in the spirit and walking in the spirit and doing what his word says, people will start coming to you from all over for answers. That's why I went to school. I remember even at that time I was thinking, God, I don't know. That was right after, uh, it was not too long after 9-11. Um, uh, it was in 2004 that I started a school, but I was thinking on that and I thought, God, I remember that at that time in the church that I was in, there was people that came and asked us to have a special service. They asked for a service during that time. They were asking for answers. And I remember thinking, I need to go to school because I need more information. I need more answers for myself because I know what I believe, but I don't know especially what to tell others a lot of times. So God wants us to get more informed. He wants us to get the word in us because how are you gonna give people answers if we don't have the word in us? We have gotta get so on fire for God and with that word just living and abiding in us and just being so part of us that we don't have to think twice even about what to tell people, that we just know what to tell them because it's in us. So we need to find, find a place. If you don't, can't enroll in Bible school here, go online, go to a Bible school or something or other. Get the word in you. You'll be amazed at how much more. You might think you already know it. I've been a Christian all my life. I thought I knew quite a bit. I had been to a lot, to a lot of seminars. I had been to a lot of Bible teachings. I taught Sunday school for years, uh, both adults and children. And not very, not very many times that I teach adults. Most of the time I taught children, but I really thought I knew the word pretty well. And my first year was not that difficult, but I'm telling you, as I got more into it and the depths of the things that I began to learn, and just the fact that keeping you in the Word, keeping you there in the Word every day, because you had to read so many pages. Bob can tell you, I had to read, at least I, I would get my book, and if it had 400 pages in it, I would divide it by the number of days that I had to read it in, and that's how many days I had to commit to read every single day in order to get that book read on time. And so that I just had to make a commitment to study and to read and to do those things. By doing that, though, you get yourself into a pattern of studying the word. You get yourself into a pattern of uh, living for God every day, doing the things that you're supposed to do. And that word becomes more part of you, part of you every day because it becomes a habit. We talked here a, lot, a few weeks ago or months ago about habits, establishing habits. That is a habit that needs to be established in our lives. Get up in the morning, praise God, and put him first in your life right then. I like to pray. Some people pray at nighttime. Some people pray at different times of the day. But I like to really do my, my praying and reading the word in the morning before I go to work because I feel like that it just like prepares me for the day. And I also pray and cancel all the plans of the enemies over my life because, believe me, praying one time, that enemy is going to try to sneak in every little way he can. And if he can... Uh, cause something to happen in the day to kind of ca cause you to forget your words that you should be saying, cause you to say something you shouldn't, you're going to open the door to allow him to have a little bit more ground. And so you would need to really pray before you start the day, I believe. That's what I like to do. I used to get up real early in the morning and go walking. Now I get up in the morning and pray. <laughs> but, you know, I try to get my walking in even still. We also have to keep moving physically. God expects us to take care of our temple as well as keep, keeping our spiritual life going. Because as long as we take care of our temple, we're able to do a little bit more all the time. So some people believe the scripture is concerning this Jewish people that we just got through reading a while ago. But I believe, like I said, it has got to be for the church because there is only going to be one. There isn't just God's chosen people over there. We were grafted in. Remember, we were adopted. We were grafted in. And we are Abraham's seed. So we are just as much a Jew as they are. We are just as much of God's chosen people as they are. So we are that, we are the same, we are one with them. We're one because we're Abraham's seed by faith. Praise God. All right, uh, when those masses of people uh, come in that darkness, they're going to come to the light. 
And if we're letting our light shine, they're going to come to us. And hopefully, we'll all be letting our light shine. Praise the Lord. And they'll all be converted. I believe in this last revival, we are going to see millions, millions converted. Because this is going to be the greatest revival of all time. I believe this is the latter rain that he's pouring out. In the days of, uh, of uh, Pentecost, on the days whenever the, the, the disciples were in the upper room there, and they were filled and baptized with the Holy Spirit, and the work that was done then by the apostles, it could be the acts of the Holy Spirit that did them, actually through the people. And that's what he wants to do now. He wants to continue. Acts is still ongoing. And he wants to revive the church. He wants to revive the church and get us back to where we're doing those same works. And you can believe that whatever works they did in the first, uh, in the apostles' day, are going to be greater in the end time because the latter rain is always greater than the former rain. Let me read this, this section here in Joel. Uh, Joel 2, 25 to 32 in the King James. He said, And I will restore to you the years that the locust hath eaten, the canker worm, and the caterpillar, and the palmer worm, and my great army which I sent among you. And you shall eat in plenty, and be satisfied, and praise the name of the Lord your God, that hath dealt wondrously with you, and my people shall never be ashamed. And ye shall know that I am in the midst of Israel, or Prescott Valley, or wherever you live, and that I am the Lord your God and none else, and my people shall never be ashamed. And it shall come to pass afterward that I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your old men shall dream dreams, your young men shall see visions. And also upon the servants and upon the handmaids in those days will I pour out of my spirit. And I will show wonders in the heavens and in the earth, blood and fire and pillars of smoke. The sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before the great and terrible day of the Lord come. And it shall come to pass that whoever calls upon the name of the Lord shall be delivered. For in Mount Zion and in Jerusalem shall be deliverance, as the Lord has said, in the remnant whom the Lord shall call. There always has been a remnant all throughout the ages, even through the dark ages. Even through, you know, whenever the, there was a great falling away at a, a certain periods of time in history, great fallings away, but there was always a remnant. There was always certain people that held out, and certain people would suddenly get a hold of a certain truth and begin to rise to the top and start uh, the Reformation movement, start, uh, start a little church somewhere. First thing you know, the word of God began to spread. People that are hungry and begin to know that something is real are going to come to the real. They're going to come to it because they're gonna know that that's real. And I, I remember, I'll never forget that day that whenever I called on God and I said, God, are you really real? Are you really up there? And God answered my prayer. Many people are at that place of decision even right now are wondering, I've had people ask me, well, how do you know God's really real? You know, how do you know this or that? But we have to make, make sure that we have answers for people and tell them all you have to do is call on God. He, his, he's in the saving business. He wants to save you. If you call on him, he will reveal himself to you. And I believe that God is raising up people all over the world, even now, by revealing himself to them, just to call them out and send them forth into the harvest field. He said the harvest, the fields are already ripe unto harvest. They're already ripe. There's people out there, right? it's ripe right now. People out there right now, the wanting or looking for something to save them, looking for some way out, some, some way to make sense of this world and the, the chaos that they're going through. And we need to make sure that they get the truth. He, he wants to send laborers into the harvest field. Somebody's got to reap these souls. Somebody's got to reap this. Remember that song, Bringing in the Sheaves? That's what it's all about. That's the harvest. We've got to, have, we've got to start bringing in these sheaves, bringing in the souls. And so we need to uh, say, God, I'll go, I'll go. He's looking for people to go into the harvest fields. He's l looking for people to send out there to tell the world about Jesus. Praise God. Wow. So through the years, since the fiery start of the church in the book of Acts, the church continued their beliefs and their practices for a certain length of time, and then they began to fall away. And even Paul, like I told you earlier, Paul and James and probably many of the others already began to see it happening. It was already beginning to happen whenever Paul was sitting there in prison, writing that letter to Timothy. He was just trying to admonish Timothy, just like I am you to right now, to contend for the faith, to stand fast and contend for that faith. Do not let this creep into your, uh, into your midst. Do not let these false prophets creep into your midst and deceive the people and to contend for the faith that was first handed down to you. 
and uh, he encouraged Timothy so many times to do just that. Here in James 3, it says, Beloved, when I gave all diligence to write unto you of the common salvation, it was needful for me to write unto you and exhort you that you should earnestly contend for the faith which was once delivered unto the saints. So here already James was telling them to contend for that faith. And Paul, when he was writing to Timothy in Timothy 1, 13 to 14, King James, Hold fast the form of sound words which thou hast heard of me, in faith and love which is in Christ Jesus, that good thing which was committed unto thee, keep by the Holy Ghost which dwelleth in thee. Keep it. Keep those words that you've learned of me. And he was telling him to contend for the faith in those so many words. And in 2 Timothy also 2, 11 through 12, it says, It's a faithful saying, for if we be dead with him, we shall also live with him. This is laying down our lives. If we are dead with him, if we've laid down our lives, we're going to live with him forever, throughout all eternity. If we suffer, we shall also reign with him. And if we deny him, he will also deny us. Remember the story about the girl that was standing there facing being killed if she didn't deny her faith? And Jesus spoke to her and said, don't deny me. Just keep those words in your head. No matter what happens in the years ahead, and the months ahead, we don't know how soon anything is going to happen. This whole thing, I mean, they're talking about disasters in uh, 2000, January of 2017. That's less than a year away. They're talking about the Antichrist, the end of August. I don't know that these are true prophecies, but you don't know. And the thing is, we've got to be ready. These things can happen suddenly upon us. We need to be ready and we need to have, have a word always out of our mouth to tell people about Jesus. Always tell them what, why this faith is in us. Why we stand for what we stand for. And we have to be kind to people. We have to love them. Love them into the kingdom. Just love them into the kingdom. They already know they're sinners. They already know they're lost. They already know something's wrong. Almost everybody, I believe, there's in, born in us something that tells us that there is a God in heaven. That we know that there is a supreme being somewhere. And, we just, and people just don't know him. But that is in, born in people. I don't have that scripture right now at my fingertips either. Uh, all of these things. I had so many things today thinking just so much going through my head that I didn't know where to begin and what to write down and what not to write down. Uh, but there is a scripture that says that, that everybody seems to know that God has put in them that they know that God, that there is a God. All we need to tell them, his name is Jesus. His name is Jesus. He died for you. He loves you. He wants you to just turn your life over to him. And so many people, if they're really hungry, they will do that. Uh, I also, God also gave me a real revelation on a scripture in, um, I don't know if I can find it or not. I don't know where it is. Um, about us being like trees planted by the rivers of water, that we are like trees planted by the, it was a psalm, um, oh, I can't think of the name of the reference right now. But anyway, it was, it's in the, it was the very first psalm. It's coming to me, it's coming to me. It was the first psalm. Um, said that uh, those that walk not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor listen, um, listen to false doctrine, or listen to the, the words of the world. I can't remember exactly how it goes. But anyway, it says that, and stand not in the way of sinners, nor sit in the seat of the scornful. Standing in the way of sinners, it could be taken two ways. First of all, you're acting like them, or, and, and either way, it's, it's going to keep them from coming to Christ. If you're acting like them, they're not going to come to Christ. Or if you're standing in the way in some other way of preventing them from coming to God. But if standeth in the way of sinners, or sitteth in the way, seat of the scornful. The seat of the scornful, people that are criticizing, finding fault with people, uh, demeaning them. You know, they don't need that. They need our love. They don't want, need that. But he says, but his delight shall be in the law of the Lord. And in him shall he meditate day and night. And he shall be like a tree planted by the rivers. And he shall bring forth his fruit in his season. What is his fruit in his season? It's souls. Our fruit is going to be winning souls. And so we bring forth his fruit in his season. And also his leaf shall not wither. And whatsoever he touches, doth whatever he doeth, shall prosper. You know, the, when I read this, the Lord just kind of gave me this picture in my head of this oasis in the middle of the desert and these tall trees just reaching to the sky, green, beautiful trees. It says his leaf shall not wither. And it says, I believe that these are beautiful, tall trees. And here there's a wanderer out there in the desert 
that is about to die of thirst. And he sees these trees, and he knows that where there's trees like that, there's got to be water nearby. So this is what they call an oasis in the middle of the desert. And this traveler comes, and he comes to those trees, and he's nourished. He comes and he drinks. And, you know, Jesus talks about himself as people coming to him uh, for, for water, for this living water. We have that same living water within us because we have the Holy Spirit in us. We have God in us, and they're going to come whenever they see us there. We're, they're going to come and see our light, and we're going to be like those trees that are going to be ready to nourish and ready to give forth the water to help people, and those lives will be saved. And that's exactly the way I see the world right now. I feel like the world is like in that desert area. And we are supposed to be like those trees, those trees planted by the rivers of water so that they are free to come to us and that we have water to give them to save them. Praise God. I don't know where I'm going to start next week. I honestly don't. I just jumped all over the place. But I think it's 7 o'clock, so I think I'm going to end with that right now and give you that vision to retain in your head about those trees of living where you're standing there as, as a tree planted by the rivers of water and you have the source, you have the life source to give to those that are thirsty. It's within you. And he said it's going to spring up like rivers of living water from, our, from out of our belly shall come forth rivers of living water. And that living water is going to save many. But remember we need to pray Pray, pray, pray. That's all I can say. Let's stand. Let's just stand and close in prayer.